Step into the world of power, loyalty, and luck. I'm going to make him an offer he can't refuse. With family, cannolis, and spins mean everything. Now, you want to get mixed up in the family business. Introducing The Godfather at ChompaCasino.com. Test your luck in the shadowy world of the Godfather slot. Someday, I will call upon you to do a service for me. Play the Godfather, now at ChampaCasino.com. Welcome to the family. No purchase necessary. VGW Group. Voidware prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. We'd like to pay tribute to Kevin Campbell, who recently passed away at the age of 54. Kevin joined Forrest in the summer of 1995 for £2.5 million from Arsenal. He's best remembered for his opening day hat-trick against Coventry City in 1996 and for forming a formidable partnership with Pierre van Hooydonk during our promotion campaign in 1997-98, where Kevin scored 23 goals. The world is a lesser place without Kevin and his infectious personality and his unrivaled energy for the game he loved. We will all miss you, Kev. Hello and welcome to 1865, the Nottingham Forest podcast with me, your host, Rich Ferraro. It's very nearly the start of a new season with all the excitement and optimism that goes with it. And today, our first Forest Ramble podcast of the season is going to discuss hopes and fears for the season ahead, getting quizzical with Guess That Red, the Forest Ramble sketch reflects upon the summer, England lost in the final, which was a bit of a bummer. Hear from a Reds fan about how you can do your bit and the women's team go pro and we're well up for it. All this and more coming up in this episode of 1865, the Nottingham Forest podcast. Now, let's say a quick hello to today's panel. And before we get on to talking about Forest, uh, as we mentioned, obviously, we saw England in the Euros fall with five minutes to go and now there is a search for a new manager so so greetings to you Tom Newton I hope you had a good summer uh, what do you think about England and who do you think the new gaffer is going to be I was really optimistic going into the Euros with England because of the squad they had and it was just a bit of a slow burner and then they got to the final and ultimately the best team um, who were consistent all the way through the final in Spain won and deservedly so and then talk about the new manager I think the FA will play it safe and appoint somebody um, within the FA so I think Lee Carsley will ultimately get the job a bit on the same path as when Southgate got it when he was an interim manager then they gave it to him full time so I think it's going to be uh, Lee Carsley because I think if they wanted Eddie Howe I think it's going to cost too much money to get him out of Newcastle Mm, OK. And Stephen Topless. Um, yeah, I'm, I don't think I think it's, it's difficult to disagree with the fact that Spain were the best team in the tournament. Um, I think Tom's dis- description of England as slow burning was um, uh, it, it was apt in some ways. Um, ultimately, they fell short, though, didn't they? Yeah, they did. And similar deficiencies in the England team came up again, having that control in big games that sometimes is lacking. But we had some great moments along the way. When you think of Bellingham's goal, you think of the Watkins goal late in the semi-final against the Netherlands, some brilliant moments. And yes, it was a bit stodgy. It was a bit of a struggle at times, but England still got to the final. And to do that on foreign soil for the men's team, having never done that before, was massive. So it's disappointing that we couldn't win the final. I hoped that at the experience of three years earlier would would play a part and, and get us over the line. It didn't happen, but plenty I still think to look back on and be proud of. And I think with a with the passage of time, we'll look back uh, perhaps a bit more fondly on this tournament and and Southgate's reign. As for the new manager, I agree with Tom. I, th- I think they're going to go with that route of Lee Carsley and promoting with from within. And I'm not completely against that. I think it's a smart move. He's done a good job with the under twenty ones. His style of football is really good. And the other thing is it could potentially, if we went for Carsley and it was interim, pave the way for a, a certain Spaniard, Mr. Pep Guardiola, coming in at some point down the line when he's done with Man City. And that would be interesting, wouldn't it? 
Oh, I, th- I thought you were going to say that when you said with, if Carsley got the job, it could pave the way for. And I thought Morgan Gibbs White to get into the senior squad. So um, <laughs> that's where I thought you were going with that. Well, that um, too. Fingers crossed. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, just, I'm just, I'm just going to throw it out there. Um, and I said this in our group chat over the summer about who the new manager is going to be. I still wouldn't be massively surprised if it's Steve Cooper because from what I'm reading, Leicester fans even though the season hasn't started, they're, they're really not fans of him. And I reckon he's going to get the boot, um, you know, by November, by which time the FA might want to make a decision about a permanent a permanent gaffer. Tom, what do you think? Yeah, I'm looking at Twitter yesterday regarding Leicester. I think they, um, they lose 3-0 to Lance and they, they're saying, oh, come and just leave Steve Cooper in uh, for Anderson. Is that, is that Bree Samba's loss? Yes, it is. Um, and he played yesterday, so I don't think they're very happy with him. And being um, ex Forest, that he's not going to warm quickly to them. But, uh, but yeah, you never know in football, do you? So where stranger things have happened. So um, yeah, if he's out the job in November, you never know. The FA could come uh, calling, and we might have a Welshman in charge of the England squad. I mean, yes, obviously he's not English, which is uh, another thing which, uh, in many ways, would give Carsley a bit more credit in the bank. But but Stephen, I mean. I can see Cooper working quite similar to to the way that Southgate has in terms of obviously he knows a lot about development and that's where he's kind of put his put his stock in trade. Uh, but also he's got a track record of of being successful. I mean, I guess Carsley Cooper, it's more or less the same with the difference being that Steve Cooper's got first team management experience. Yes, um, both of them have tournament winning experience with England, which is massive and much like De La Fuente did with Spain, you know, that there's a lot of parallels there that sometimes you don't necessarily have to be a, a club manager in order to be a good international manager and the roles can be very separate. So on that basis, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be against Steve Cooper. And if you were to look at it and step outside from Forest for a moment and look at the job Steve, Steve Cooper did, that's a phenomenal job to pull Forrest into the Premier League and get them where they were, especially the job he inherited when he came in. They'd be man, you know, we'd if we were looking at that at another club, you'd be looking at Cooper and saying, the guy's got something special potentially here, and he has got all the credentials to in the future being the manager. So yeah, I wouldn't rule it out, not at all. And I, I guess the other thing that's worth thinking about is in terms of you could say that he's got the same kind of pros and cons as as Southgate in terms of his management style. For example, the fact that they can play quite well. He's got a core of players that he likes to trust. But then, you know, there is the same accusation that in matches against good teams, he can go a little bit conservative and maybe struggle to kind of break out of the low block. I don't know what you think there, Tom. Yeah, um, I agree. I mean, when you look at the Spain game, they they were like head and shoulders above us, and you had like players who could really control the game. And you just look at how, and we was just like, we were just like trying to keep our heads above water, like, and and they were like just coming at us, and we just couldn't get out of our own half at times. And and I think that mentality, I thought it because we lost the final like a few years ago. I thought that would put us in good stead. But when we played the better teams, we played France a few years ago in Qatar, and we just seem to have that problem of managing games and controlling games. And when you look at the players, you you would think, because they played for Man City, Real Madrid, etc., you think they'd be able, um, capable of doing it. And when we get on to, to the international stage, we're all out against the, like, the lesser team. But when we play against one of the big hitters, we do ultimately struggle uh, with that side of the game. And that needs to improve if we're going to win a tournament anytime soon. Well, yes. Um, so... I- I mean, obviously, time will tell. And in the meantime, Lee Carsley has got the job on an interim basis. And I can understand why they're doing that. So as long as it turns out more Gareth Southgate than Steve McLaren, uh, you know, I think it, there's there's potential there. Um, now, let's be honest, OK, we've just spent sort of five minutes talking about England. But really, we're here to talk about Forest. So before we talk about the men's team, here's an important message about something new that we're doing this season. Hi, it's Adam here, and I'm really pleased to announce that the, this season, 1865, is going to be the place to get fan-led coverage of NFFC women. We will be reporting on every home match and giving weekly updates on the women's team and their progress 
as they play their first season as professionals. Stay tuned to the podcast for our regular shows and find out our socials for more updates. All details are at 1865.football. We've got a great, exciting season for you all. Let's get it. Thank you, Adam. And uh, yeah, I mean, Tom, it's one of those things that we really, it's very exciting, the fact that, and and says a lot about the direction of the club uh, under the Maranakis regime, that for all the kind of things that have gone wrong, the women's team are something where the club have invested and now they're going professional and going to be playing their matches at City Ground. These are positive things, no? Definitely. And I'll be honest, I don't know, I don't, um, too much about the um, the Forest uh, women's team, apart from the gone professional and everything, but that's going to put us in good stead um, in years to come because um, you, Maranakis wants to make Nottingham Forest like more inclusive for everybody. And and if you've got a women's team and you can see local um, female players, uh, etc., getting into the women's team, it like leads a path for the like the city and everything. If girls want to get into football, so it's a win win for the club and. And if they start progressing, then they'll be playing against the likes of like Man City, Arsenal, etc. Um, it's only uh, going to be good things uh, for the club um, moving forward. Yeah, and uh, we're hoping to hear from Ellie a little bit later, because as well as Adam and Ellie providing coverage of NFFC women, uh, and they are season ticket holders, so we hope to have plenty of coverage for you. Um, we also will hear from Ellie a little bit later with uh, some more about Garibaldi Girls, which is the project that she started to give female fans a bit of a just a bit of community. Um, there have been times, of course, that I think any fan from a minority sometimes feels like, oh, is there a place for me here? So that's what Garibaldi Girls is about. Um, Stephen. There have been times on this podcast where we have been very critical about the Maranakis regime in terms of various things about how they've run the club, decisions they've made. And most of the things that we've talked about have been focused upon the men's team and I guess with the PSR issues about the club as a whole. But I think it's fair to say, isn't it, that uh, one of the things that has been constant is that Maranakis, as he has done with Olympiakos, really wants the club to be at the heart of the community. Yeah, that's one of his big positives. And a lot of steps have been made during his time as owner of the club. And that's been a great a great thing to see because there's been times in, in Forest's past where it's been very disconnected from its community and it's suffered because oh, of it. And likewise, exactly. And likewise, the community has suffered for it as well. So it's a two way relationship and it's it's good to see that that's healthy and initiatives like this are very important for that inclusivity and making sure that Forest is a welcome place for all. Um, and yeah, and I'm so pleased to see that the the women's team has, has, has gone professional. They're going to be playing at the city ground in a bigger venue. The, the, the opportunity to get more people through the gates and grow grow the fan base for for the women's team it it, is great seeing women's football in this country is growing and it's gaining popularity and it's it's good to see that Forest are very much part of that as well on a more local level yeah and I mean the other thing that I will say is uh, um, like Tom I'm no expert on the women's game but when I've seen matches on TV, for example, I think I saw Everton versus Arsenal and they're basically playing in what looked like a training ground and where you're playing in a training ground or a local clubs, uh, you know, for example, obviously Forrest played at, at Long Eaton and so on. It just adds such a sense of occasion to have it in the men's stadium. And also I could imagine that for a lot of other clubs, particularly the ones who aren't professional yet, that it'll be pretty intimidating. So it'll really add to that sense of home advantage for, for the women's team. Um, so we're really excited to add this string to our bow. Now we are going to talk primarily about the men's team. And I say, we'll have those regular updates in our feed. So stay tuned. Uh, all of the details are on 1865. So that's one word. 1865.football, we can find out about all of our socials, TikTok, Instagram, threads, um, what else? Twitter, yeah, we're still doing Twitter despite Elon's best efforts. And also you can find our show on Apple, Spotify and YouTube and most places that you'll find podcasts. Now, 
onto the men's team. If you're a regular listener, you'll know this. But if you're new here, then this is the home of match reports from every single game, home and away of the Forest men's team. So as well as Tom and Stephen, we've got our team of Baz and George and the Married on the Midlands. We have a few guest podcasters once in a while as well. And we like to also try and get a view from the um, from the away end or if we're playing away from the opposition. Our newshound Jamie also brings you a weekly roundup of the big stories coming from the City Ground every Friday uh, before match day in a podcast that we call Friday Five. And as well as following us on all of those places that we mentioned, the simplest thing to do is subscribe. So subscribe via Spotify, subscribe via Apple. If you can, leave us a review, because if you like our content, then that will help other people to find our content. So, uh, you know, let's let's. Park that to one side. We hope that you will join us throughout the season. And let's look forward to the forthcoming season. And we've got a few questions and we want to have a bit of a discussion. So, um, Tom, you know, having written for uh, 442 and so on and, and contributed to a few uh, previews in the past, you came up with this kind of series of questions. So I'm going to start off with you with question number one. Um, as a Forest supporter, Tom, you won't be happy unless dot, dot, dot. What will it be that will make you happy this season? Um, significant um, position progress. Um, I don't want another season of relegation. I mean, I think we was very fortunate last year that the three teams that went down were worse than us. And I want to just, I'll be just happy with like a progress and a bit of a, like a boring um, position of around about 13th, 14th, where we're like, we've kicked on, but we're not in a relegation um, scrap because the teams that have come up, I know Leicester are going to get a point deduction um, soon. But then you've got um, Ipswich, who they're going to come up and everybody's like saying they play some really good football and they make Portman Road intimidating. So that they're, they're not going to be, um, they're not going to lay down, are they? And then obviously you've got Southampton, which Russell Martin seems to be this like um, expansive manager, um, up and coming and everything. And he's done a pretty good job on the South Coast. And you don't know how they're going to, um, they're going to probably be better than they were last time they were in the Premier League when they had like Nathan Jones and all of that to carry on. So um, yeah. We, I'll be happy if we get, if we progress and 13th, 14th will do me. Stephen, over to you. I won't be happy unless. Um, mine is mine is very similar to Tom. I want to see some progress, but um, I just don't want Forrest to be involved in another relegation battle. Um, I want us to be a few places away from that and a good few, few points away from it, just so that we can carry on building and establishing. So for me, I won't be happy unless Forrest are having a boring season and we are comfortably 14th, 15th, some good performances and players continuing to develop the likes of Alanga, hudson Adoy, the new signings bedding in well, players from last year like Sangare, hopefully now kicking on and, and really establishing themselves in the Forest team. And yeah, that will make me happy. A very uh, a comfortable, uneventful season. Okay, and and for me, I, I'm going to echo what what both of you have said. I think um, progress is one word that I'm looking for. I mean, obviously, last season we stayed up, and I heard an interview with Chris Wood where he's talking about second season syndrome and how you know a lot of clubs can fall victim to that. Forest kind of did but as you mentioned Tom they they were lucky that there were three teams worse than them so we finished with a lower points total we had the worst points total of any team staying up um in in Premier League history and I think we need to have some progress so we need to make sure that we are not um in that same scrap again for me though thinking more specifically I won't be happy unless we stop losing matches three two because that's really annoying. I mean, it's great for the neutrals, but uh, yeah, um, there were too many of those last season. Um, okay, it's back to you, Tom, and with question number two. The big talking point is... Off the field matters. It's got to be the city ground. Um, trying to get that deal over the line and to obviously secure the leasehold of the city ground so we can actually progress uh, the infrastructure of the club because 
we're doing our ap absolute utmost to try and squeeze as many into the city ground and we've we've had to like take a wall out for example and put like two extra rows in low drying cloth and and then you've got like what is it 11 12 000 on the waiting list and and etc so we need to get this deal sorted out with the with the council and um, start getting spades in the ground and demolishing the um, the main stand and um, build this new Peter Taylor stand because like I says it's been going on for five years now and uh, we need to start kicking off um, kicking on off the field to um, remain competitive in the Premier League. Well, and there were times that it looked like it was kicking off between the uh, forest and the various councils. <laughs> um, do you think that the changes um, in political positions will? Um, have a positive influence and certainly the new the new leader of the council um i mean obviously what people say and what people do are two different things but um she sounds very positive about and using much more conciliatory language than than the previous incumbent yeah I mean, there's a lot of people that come under the same umbrella so you've got the three councils then you've got obviously the boat club to deal with and apparently we can't demolish the main what well, Peter Taylor stand until they've got a new facility. So there's a lot of like, factors um, in it, but it seems to be going in the right direction. She's managed to get the club and the council around the table and things are progressing in the background. So hopefully we'll get an announcement sooner rather than later and um, can have like a, a date where that relic of the main stand, I mean, it's got a lot of history, but it's it's so tired now beyond belief and um, trying to get like a new um, Peter Taylor stand and we can actually progress the club off the field yeah um yeah thank you and um just one thing to um uh point out is uh from the pre-season uh match uh last week you did post a picture where you pointed out that because of the fact that they've mounted the video screen that used to be in Trent End Corner they've mounted that on the inside of the Trent End now haven't they which means that for someone like you who's in the bridge upper Bridgeford you can't actually see either of the video screens because they're out of your line of sight yeah I get to see like a quarter of it and people say oh do you really need the screen and it's like I get where they're coming from if we was in the championship with no VAR but yeah. VAR is so part and parcel of the Premier League I would like to see as a paying fan what decision has been given for and against outside and uh, like I said and we all know that the internet connection in the city ground is not great so so you, but having said that when you go to Man United and Liverpool they haven't got a video screen so swings and roundabouts but it'd be nice to actually see what decisions being made on the screen which I could see the, the previous two seasons but this season they're not going to like just put a big screen up just for my um, viewing <laughs> uh, are they so, uh, so I'm, I'll just have to like uh, get my head around it and uh, deal with it like I mean, I, I, think, I think there's an argument to say that um, in this day and age, though, the video screen is part is part of the the um, spectator experience, shall we put it that way? So not just actually, obviously, having the team announcements and everything, but the replays and the the half time bits and pieces. Sure, during the match, unless it goes to VAR, then you're not missing out on much because you're watching the, watching what's happening on the pitch, and you don't need to see an advert for you know a local double glazing company every time the ball goes out of play. But uh... yeah, but another thing is that when you go to uh, Brentford, um, or um, suspended from the roof is actual screens where you can actually see what's going on so yeah i'm not saying forests are going to do that but it'd be it'd be nice if they did do that and actually so you, you can see what's happening with a var decision or uh, etc but we'll have to see what happens in the future yeah well maybe uh another few years and every every fan will every match going fan will have their own um augmented reality helmets that they can wear when they go to matches uh i mean having said that tom you know you're, you're sitting there wearing your specs at the moment i don't know i don't know what you're looking at on the inside of those specs so, <laughs> so there you go um let's move on to you Stephen. the big talking point is or will be yeah, much like Tom, it's going to be the the stadium redevelopment, but I think also just trying to unite the fan base and the the potential for us moving to Toten upset a lot of people, rightly so. And the club have got work to do to to repair that relationship and convince people that they are fully committed to Forest's best interests. And coming back to that point of community, you know, doing all that they can to keep the club in the city of Nottingham in, within those those boundaries. All right, it's Rushcliffe, but it's close enough, um, the city around. But yeah, 
that is the big talking point now that get the the stadium development up and running, get that leasehold sorted, freehold, sorry, and just get get it all together and and you know we can start building now and creating a venue that that's fit for twenty first century football and and Premier League football. Mm, yeah okay i mean uh yeah I, again sort of difficult to disagree with with, with what, what either of you are saying um for me the big talking point is something that i just saw on threads yesterday which is that uh, felipe who uh apparently still lives in mapley park by the way um but felipe seems to be growing his hair again so that to me is the big talking point and if he's still going to post on instagram and threads then uh, it's something that i'm sure that the men and women of nottingham will be viewing with interest uh Let's move on. And uh, the third question, uh, Tom, the pantomime villain of this season will be? Anyone between Stuart Atwell, Gary Neville and VAR. OK, yeah. Uh, I mean, obvi- for obvious, obvious reasons, if you had to put uh, put money on one of those. VAR. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. OK. Um, interestingly, Tom, uh, during the... In the last few international tournaments, World Cups and Euros, VAR was really, really efficiently and nicely implemented. And I thought it's a little bit more clunky this time around, wasn't it? Yeah, and I just I just need to like strip it back and actually, but they keep like changing it, changing it. Then something else happens one week, then they have a sit around the table and and it's like, oh, we're going to change it again and everything. And it's like, you could have like three different versions of events for like a handball in the box or a foul and everything. It just needs to be stripped back and started um, again, uh, really. But they're not going to do that. And like I says, I'm not, I was like um, saying last season how much VAR favours the top six. And I don't think that's going to change this season, to be honest. Mm, yeah, uh, I mean, I think there's there's an issue, isn't there, about about processes and outcomes outcomes of dependence upon the processes and clearly uh pogmol have not got the processes right when it comes to var and you consider the amount of money and the amount of people involved and it just i don't know maybe the problem is that they're doing it by committee and and that that it's funny isn't it you've got the nostalgia about well at least when there's just one referee on the pitch then you had someone to blame and you could understand an individual making an error. And that was the thing that was so frustrating, particularly with that Everton match, was the uh, the Ashley Young uh, challenge on Callum hudson Adoy. The ref clearly got it wrong. That happens. But VAR did absolutely nothing to, to, to help him out. Um, let's move on to you, Stephen. Who's the pantomime villain going to be? Um, I, th- I think the pantomime villain could be fan expectation and from certain sections of the fan base um looking back to last season i think people a certain section of the fan base were were guilty of thinking well we've stayed up now everything's going to be great we're going to kick on we're going to play expansive football we're going to finish top 10 and we are going to really establish ourselves and and possibly even push for europe and they were legitimate points that people, some people were making last season. Um, and, I, and I think that just contributed to unrealistic expectations. And I'm concerned that that could happen again this season. It, it, people don't seem to realise how difficult it is to establish in the Premier League, especially when we've been out of it for so long. Um, and I'm not going to talk about the merits of whether Steve Cooper should have stayed yeah. or gone because that's done now. But I do think the the certain people's expectations last season put pressure on the team to perform in a certain way. I think it affected their their own enjoyment of the Premier League and actually embracing the fact that Forest is a Premier League team and playing at the highest level. Um, and and I I just worry that if we if we have those those kind of high expectations again, people are just going to end up very disappointed. I think it's slow and steady progress that we need to be making. And I'm hoping that what happened last season and Nuno coming in and having to make that managerial change has tempered expectations somewhat. And people will be, some people and a certain section of the fan base will be more realistic in, in what they expect from Forest this season. Mm, and uh, I mean, on that, on that topic, I would uh, also Add in there that, um, you know, social media, we know how reliable it is, but there's a lot of people who seem to be very excited and kind of say, well, Forrest can, we've signed 
what, four or five players, not all of whom are going to be first team regulars straight away. And that is for slow and steady progress. You're not going to jump up the league on that basis. Now, the counter argument to that is that obviously a few of the teams around us, Fulham are a great example. They've sold players. So Fulham have sold Polina, who was, to me, their most uh, important player. But equally, Fulham have got a really experienced and really, um, you know, I was really sceptical about Marco Silva in the early days, but I think he's proven himself to be a really good manager. So so it ain't going to be that easy. And I strongly suspect that the three coming up might be the ones who are most in danger of going down again. And particularly with McKenna and Martin, I wonder if they're going to get a little bit found out in terms of people who can get their teams playing nice football, but that's about it, kind of in the same way as Burnley did under Vincent Company. Although, of course, for McKenna and Martin, I think both of them can look forward to uh, to lovely jobs if they do decide to leave uh, their respective clubs. Not quite on the scale of Company going to Bayern Munich after relegation, but, you know, there you go. Um, let's move on. So, player to watch. Uh, I'm going to come to you first, Stephen, this time. Who's going to be the player to watch for Forrest? Um, I think it's going to be one of the new signings, and I think it's going to be Jota Silva. Um, I'm really excited to see how he comes in and, and performs, and um, he he looks to be a really creative and exciting player, somebody who, who is on the up in terms of his career and his Progression, 15 goals in, what, 42 matches last season. Assists, he's had a call-up for Portugal in that time. Um, yeah, so I'm excited to see how he adapts to the Premier League. And I think we do need some depth in those positions out wide. So while I think Alanga and Callum Hudson-Odoi are going to be really important players, um, I, I, th- I think Jota Silva could be one that comes in and, and really really gives us something different and a bit of an unknown quantity for the Premier League, which which I, I think is quite exciting. Mm. And uh, I think with with Jota coming in, one of the things that is interesting is that obviously we ended up with Nico Dominguez filling in on the wings and at number 10 and so on. And I think that Jota has the capability of kind of covering all of those, but he could also with big team being made of biscuits and Chris Wood being another year older, um, I've been told that uh, Jota might be able to fill in as a centre forward as well, much like his uh, his namesake Diogo at Liverpool can pl- cover all of those areas. Um, Tom, what about you? Who do you think is going to be the player to watch? I'm going to go for Ibrahim Sangari. Um, last season was a difficult season for him. Deadline signing, um, didn't really get going. Injuries, then malaria, AFCON. And got injured at the AFCON, didn't he? And only play um, a few substitute appearances back into the season. And he looks like he's come back and by all accounts, he's playing uh, pretty well, um, quite solid. And he's the Ibram Sangari who we thought was buying from PSV last summer. Um, so I think he's going to kick on. Um, and he's, if you watch the videos, what the social media team at Forest has been putting out, he's got a massive smile on his face. And he seems to be playing with a lot of confidence and uh, I think he's quite settled. Obviously, you've got Willie Bolly at the club who's from Ivory Coast and international teammate. So I think he's going to be the, uh, the one to watch and uh, I think a lot of fans in the next few months will be saying he's one of those players who you can't leave out the side. Yeah, and uh, I think it, uh, with Sangare, I think the other thing that maybe in terms of fan expectations is uh, I think he's one of those players who won't necessarily always shine as an individual, but I think he will be somebody who adds to the team, and that's the hope. Um, for me, I'm going to nominate another one of the new boys, uh, Milenkovic, um, not just because he's huge and he's experienced, but I also think that we've really got a steal there to get him for 12 million euros. Um, oh, sorry, 12 million pounds, wasn't it? Um, and the word on the street is that he was let go because he's on high wages. In the Premier League, wages are just, you know, one of those things that, clubs can offer bigger wages it means that we've got him for a decent fee and I think that bearing in mind that Bolly hasn't got a very good track record of playing more than 20-25 games per season um, we need somebody who's tall and commanding to play alongside Murillo so I think that that's something the other thing that's worth pointing out and at the risk of stating the blooming obvious is that I don't know how much Carlos Miguel's going to play but with him and Milenkovic 
it's quite interesting to hear Matt Sell's interview where he's saying with set pieces, the actual processes, we got the processes OK and we're still conceding. So it's now about players taking responsibility. And I think with Milenkovic, it is a player who's going to take responsibility. And we saw that when Bolly came back towards the end of the season, that we started conceding fewer goals from set pieces. And I think that um, now that we've got another big defender there who can kind of organise and lead, I'm confident that that will lead to better outcomes in terms of defending our own goal. Um, last question. Uh, Stephen, you kind of already answered this, but what position will we finish? I think we'll finish 14th. We'll be... Um... We'll be comfortably clear of relegation. I think we'll have some good performances through the season and we will do enough to keep away from trouble and not be in a battle and and looking over our shoulders the whole campaign. So, yeah, 14th and that will do nicely for me. Tom? Yeah, I'm going to echo what um, Stephen just said. Um, Yeah, 14th place, um, progression and not looking over our shoulders uh, a relegation battle. In that case, I'm gonna I'm gonna go along with you two. Fourteenth uh, would be a very nice result indeed. So thank you both. And still to come, we'll hear from a Reds fan telling you exactly how you can easily do something extraordinary to help others. And we'll give you a game of our quiz. Guess that red. But first, it's time for this. The 1865 Forest Ramble sketch by Jeremy Davis. It was Harold Wilson, twice Labour Prime Minister in the 1960s and 70s, who observed that England only ever win the World Cup under a Labour government. And whilst the England team may have failed to seal the deal and provide the ultimate coda to that quip in the Euros this summer, there's no doubt that the UK's new government is more football friendly than recent administrations, with Keir Starmer's famously obsessive support for Arsenal, a marked contrast with the likes of David Cameron, who forgot whether he was supposed to support Aston Villa or West Ham, and probably still thinks that Claret and Blue is his order for a nice glass of red wine and a rare steak, or as the shade of blood spilled on the famous playing fields in a particularly aggressive edition of the Eton Wall game. Indeed, comparisons can be drawn between the new PM and our own head hot show, Nuno Espirito Santo. Both are essentially dull, furiously competent figures that have taken over from far more charismatic predecessors who inspired an almost cult-like level of devotion among supporters. The big difference being that Steve Cooper actually was the messianic figure that led Forrest back to the promised land, whereas Jeremy Corbyn ultimately led Labour into the wilderness. Both, though, were undone by problems balancing the left and right wing, Corbyn being unable to sort out the role of momentum, Cooper being undone by his uncertainty over the role of Morgan Gibbs-White. Another thing the Forest manager and Labour's new Prime Minister have in common is the issue with balancing the books, with a yawning black hole in the fortunes and finances of both Nottingham Forest FC and UK PLC, led over from the profligate spending of previous regimes. Forrest managed to escape total financial oblivion by flogging fan favourite Brennan Johnson to a team who attract lots of media attention despite never actually winning anything meaningful. Perhaps Starmer could try offloading Angela Rayner to the Lib Dems? Ambitious building targets can often make or break an administration. Starmer and Rayner are determined to reform the planning laws to enable them to build lots of new homes to solve the UK's current housing crisis, not to mention winning the lasting affection, support and backing of the big house-building firms. Whilst Nuno and his rich backer, that nice Mr Maranakis, would quite like to move Forrest to a new home to enable them to house lots more supporters on match days. The difference being that in Forrest's case, it's not just the NIMBYs that think this is a terrible idea. Both Forrest and the UK have appeared a bit low on energy supplies in recent times, though it's hard to see a parallel with Labour's plans to nationalise the country's energy sources Perhaps if Ryan Yates gets picked for England, you might say that Starmer's faith in Ed Miliband as the man to hit Labour's environmental targets is comparable to relying on Chris Wood to consistently hit the target for Forrest. As we head into a new season with a good deal of uncertainty hanging over the club, it's perhaps worth bearing in mind that we only ever seem to win the league, you've guessed it, under a Labour government. 
This episode is brought to you by our good friends at NFL Sunday Ticket on YouTube TV. I'm sure by now you've all gotten back into your Sunday routines, but they could be even better. With NFL Sunday Ticket and YouTube TV, you get the most live NFL games all in one place, every game, every Sunday. And you can even watch up to four different games at once with Multiview, one of my favorite inventions of this decade. It's exactly what you need to catch all the action. Make your Sundays more magical. And also, YouTube TV is great. I got it this year. It's awesome. Sign up now at youtube.com slash BS. Device and content restrictions apply. Local and national games on YouTube TV. NFL Sunday ticket for out-of-market games excludes digital-only games. You're listening to 1865, the Nottingham Forest podcast. Welcome back to 1865 and our preseason preview show with me, Rich Ferraro. Now, one of the things that we're keen to do on this podcast is focus upon the fans. In amongst the excitement and the high emotion of being a football fan, it's easy to forget that there are human beings behind it all, and most footy fans are good people with their own stories. Now, we were recently contacted at 1865 headquarters by Anthony Nolan, a charity that matches stem cell donors with patients suffering from blood cancer and blood disorders for life-saving transplants. They have a new campaign called One Million United, where they're trying to encourage sports fans to join the stem cell register. And I'm delighted to be joined by Zach, who is a Nottingham Forest fan and a stem cell donor. So, uh, Zach, welcome to the podcast. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for having me on. You know, it's a pleasure. And, you know, I'm looking forward to letting you all know about the campaign that Anthony Nolan are running and, you know, having a, having a chat with Rich. So, Yeah, I mean, well, I say really, really pleased that you can join us. And um, obviously, uh, you know, the charity got in touch with us because the, the secret of the campaign is really to try and encourage more young people to sign up to be a stem cell donor. So do you want to tell us a little bit about your story? Yeah, absolutely. So now I'm, I'm 21 years old now. Um, I donated my stem cells in January of this year. So I was, it was just before my 21st birthday. So I was 20 at the time. Um, and I signed up to the uh, the stem cell register when I was, I think I was, I was about 16 or 17. Um, it was around that age. I just applied for my driving license and there was a prompt to sign up for a blood donation just through the NHS. Um, and I've, I did that. And then about two weeks later, I got an advert on Facebook, I think, um, about Anthony Nolan. And I you know, had a read into it and what they were all about. And um, you know, read that read the story of Anthony Nolan, and I thought, yeah, that you know, why not? So I signed up for it, and it's really simple. Like once you sign up, um, they just send you like um a, a pack in the post with like um some cotton buds almost like, and you just swab your cheeks inside your cheeks, send them back off to Anthony Nolan. That all the postage is paid. Sorry, postage is paid for, um, and then yeah, they store. That's literally it. They store your DNA if you like on a on a database, and then. If a potential match pops up, they will um, cross-reference it with your DNA. If there's a preliminary match, they will contact you and come and take more blood. A nurse will come out to either your home or your workplace. It's really, you know, really simple. They're really good liaising with you. Um, and then they'll test your blood um, to make sure it's a definite match. And fortunately for me, um, I was a definite match. So I headed off to a donation centre and... Um, and they, it's really simple. They just take your blood out of one arm, pass it through a machine, it separates the stem cells, puts your blood back through the other one. And, you know, it gets sent off to someone suffering with a form of blood cancer and it hopefully gives them a second shot at life. So that sounds really, really simple. And it also sounds like, you know, I, I, for, for most people, it sounds like something that actually you can do. You know, it's, it's something that's kind of easy to do without it being kind of too intrusive. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's really simple. Sorry, there's a motorbike gone past. <laughs> it's, it's really simple. Um, you know, the blood tests that when the, when a nurse comes and visits you, all she does is literally a needle in your arm. Um, it doesn't hurt at all. It, it's, you know, it's painless. And then one, if, you know, if you are selected to be, if you are a match and the, you are selected to donate, yeah, you'll be sent to a hospital. Um, there's a there's a few donation centres across the UK. They make sure you're really comfortable. You're sat, you know, you you sat in a, in in a in a hospital bed or a chair. You can go up and down. It's just a, a you know a needle in each arm. The way out, there's two donation methods. So they either do it for your blood or for your bone marrow. And the most common one is through blood, uh, which is what I did. So through blood, you know, like I say, they just take it out one arm, pass it through the machine, back through the other. Um, but yeah, Anthony Nolan will pay for everything. They pay for your travel, whether it's trains or taxis, or they will pay for your petrol per mile. Um, hotels, they give you 
um food allowance everyday expenses um so they're you know they're really helpful and it's a really good cause and are there any particular groups that it's are there any particular groups that anti nolan looking to sign up to be potential stem cell donors uh, yeah absolutely so people within the age of between 18 to 30 particularly male um mm-hmm. male donors they are that's you know that's their demographic that they want people to come and donate that's that's the people whose blood they need the most um hence the the one million united campaign so that you know that campaign focuses on particularly young football fans hence the the united um so currently anthony and nolan have around nine hundred thousand donors on the register and they are wanting to take that up to one oops, sorry one million mm-hmm. um and this campaign is focusing on uh, you know young male and female but young football fans in particular um, to you know, irrespective of colours and teams and badge and local derbies, to all you know, get everyone involved because you never know whose whose life you might be saving. You know, one of the reasons you're here is because you are a Forest fan. You you're sitting there wearing your shirt at the moment while we're talking, and um, so I'm going to ask you in a quick fire round the same questions that we're discussing on the rest of the podcast that our panel have been discussing. So um, for the forthcoming season, uh, tell us what it is that you are expecting so the first question is i won't be happy unless oh god i won't be happy unless i get to see ryan yates jump into the trend yay that's a good answer i like that a lot okay uh what do you think the big talking point is going to be for forest fans this season i mean we, you know this is the third season of being in the premier league now so i think we're going to really i know i will look for us to push on a bit i know the last two seasons have been tough particularly last season you know we had a change of change of manager and it was really tough for us as not just as fans but i think the players and the club as a whole to move on from steve cooper because you know of the the, the massive impact he had on the club and the community but i think you know now nuno has kept us up he's had a pre-season he's had a transfer window i'm expecting us and i'm hoping us to sort of kick on you know what i've seen in sort of passages in pre-season you know, i went to chesterfield um, and I've seen highlights of the other games. And, you know, we really look like we're playing some really nice football. Um, so, you know, I, I mean, I'm not expecting us to, you know, push on for Europe. You know, that would be daft. But I think, you know, a sort of between 10th and sort of 14th would be would be nice because, you know, we finished 17th and 16th for the last two seasons, respectively. So, you know, constant, you know, just keep climbing quietly. That would be, I'd be happy with that. As I've commented elsewhere, I think the watchword is stability, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, stability. okay. Who do you think the pantomime villain's going to be for Forest fans this season? The pantomime villain? Yeah. Well, God. Dominic Solanke always scores against us. And who do you yeah. think's going to be the Forest player to watch this season? Ugh. Elliot Anderson has really shone for me pre-season. You know, he's looked really, really strong, but it all depends whether he gets him. Um, you know, some solid game time ahead of the lads we've already got in midfield. I'll be really looking forward to see what Sangari can do. Um, he didn't quite have the uh, the start we all hoped, and especially I think he would have hoped for last year. You know, a really slow start. Went to AFCON, obviously got got ill. Um, so I'm hoping he pushes on, but I really think we'll see the best out of the, the two lads out wide, so Hudson Adoy and Alanga this year, mm-hmm. I think. If we can play to their strengths, you know, getting getting the ball in behind, particularly for Anthony Alanga, you know, he's he's so quick. If we can get the ball in behind for him and then perhaps get it out wide for Hudson Adoy so he can cut in on that right foot, I think we'll see what we, you know, we saw a lot of last season, but in a in a greater depth this year. So yeah. And uh, I know you mentioned you're hoping for kind of mid-table stability. Uh let's just pin you down. What position do you think we'll finish this season? Thinking and hoping is <laughs> two completely different things. But <laughs> I think I think if we if we play, you know, if we show up the defence and we can play some nice football like everyone knows we can. I think there's there's nothing stopping us from finish, you know, 14th, 13th, 14th. So. Okay, cool. All right. So thanks very much, Zach. Really appreciate you joining us today. Uh, just to finish off, if anyone is interested in signing up to be a potential stem cell donor, what should they do? So yeah, and head to anthonynolan.org. If you just got any search engine, just search Anthony Nolan, it will take you to the website. Um, all the instructions are on there. They've got all sorts of information on there. Um, you know, donor stories, um, people who have received transplants, their stories are on there as well. You know, we are hoping for 1 million donors by sort of the end of this year. So that'll be amazing. So yeah, just head over to the website. It's got all the instructions. You just, you know, sign up with your name, email address, phone number, put your address in. The, the charity will send out the, the, the packs 
for your cheek swabs. And then, yeah, you go from there. You know, I mean, some people stay on the donor for 40 years and never get contacted. Some people are on it for six months. So, yeah. you know, it's just that sort of lottery, I suppose. But, you know, it's that feeling when you get the initial contact. I mean, I found out on my birthday. It was actually my 21st, but my 20th birthday. Uh, so last year they contacted me and then it was just before my 21st birthday that I actually donated. So head over to the website, uh, follow, you know, with, with Anthony and on Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, everything. So, you know, you can follow yeah. the story on the socials. Yeah, we'll put we'll put a couple of links on our show notes and on our socials. In the meantime, Zach, thank you so much for joining us and come on you Reds. What a great story there from Zach. And it just shows it doesn't necessarily take too much to do something extraordinary. Now, I just want to take a minute before we move on to share a few words from our friends at FanHub. Um, If you follow us on social media, you'll see us post our team predictions on match days. And if you register as a Forest fan on the app, you can gain rewards and stay in touch with your fellow Reds fans. Use our golden ticket code 186 dash erg and you can skip the waiting list and it also supports us here at 1865 towers once again all of the links are at 1865 that's the word 1865 dot football now before we play a game of guests at red let's have, head over to ellie mollison to tell us a bit about gary baldy girls and what their plans are in the near future Hi, it's Ellie here. I just wanted to give you a quick update on everything that's been happening with Garibaldi Girls. It's been an incredibly busy summer, to say the very least. Um, We were able to participate in a WTF charity match that was sponsored by Harry Toffolo, and Garibaldi Girls did sponsor a player. We partnered with her game too, and we became associate members of Football Supporters Association. We attended an annual general meeting and we're able to give our opinions on a national scale. And we've also been able to work with women supporters groups across the country directly with the Premier League to help eradicate sexual abuse in football. We had our first meeting and there are many more to come. We have made a website thanks to On and Off Creative and sign up sheet will be on there. So please look out for news on that very, very shortly. Um, Garibaldi Girls t-shirts have also been made thanks to a donation by 1865 and will be sold very soon with 100% of donations going to reinvesting in the female fan experience and local grassroots sports. And finally, we have continued to build a fantastic relationship with Forest with multiple meetings with many different um, employees of Forest. And we look forward to continuing to grow this relationship and have lots of exciting things to announce in the future. So please do look out on our social media. Thank you very much, Ellie. And we will get more updates from you and Gary Baldy Girls as the season goes on, as well as hearing from you on our women's team match reports alongside Adam. But now it's time for this. 1865. Guess that red. So for the first time this season, it is over to Quizmaster Stephen to ask us some questions. So listener, do play along at home, won't you? And for those, uh, for whichever of us win, and if neither Tom nor I win, then Stephen gets to choose our closing music for today's podcast. So over to you, Quizmaster Stephen. So your first clue is that this player was signed for Forest by Martin O'Neill. Rich. Go on. I'm going to go for Johan Beneluan. Incorrect. I was initially going to go for Jack Robinson, but he's he's, he's signed by Karanka, wasn't he? Yeah. I'll I'll have a go with another defender, Molo Wagai. Molo Wagai is also incorrect. I'm not even sure that was actually a play. I'm sure that was just a figment of our imagination. (laughs) Your next clue is that this player has made 12 international appearances for his country. Tom. Is it, is it Alex, um, Alexander Milosevic? It is Alexander Milosevic. Well done. The process of elimination because he wasn't here long, was he? Uh, he was And they also, uh, the next one would have been someone like Leo Bonatini or someone like that. So. Yeah, <laughs> I was going to go for um, oh, who was the other? Um, there's another defender as well, wasn't there? 
Uh, oh, Michael Heffler. Um, Michael he was, Heffler, yeah. Yeah, he was. He was, he was a Karanka one. one, wasn't he? Yeah. Was he? Okay. I mean, uh, yeah. clearly, clearly that sp- period of time has, has all merged into one because there were a lot of signings in a short space of time. Uh, d- d- am I? Is it just me, Tom? Do you agree with me that Milosevic felt like one who got away? Yeah, when he did play, he was all right. Then just like fell out of favour, and, and that was the end of um, end of that. So uh, yeah, when he did play, I thought he was he's all right. He represented Sweden, didn't he? Um, and, but... and and Stephen, if, if I remember rightly as well, I think he was without any any libel or slander, he uh, or, or defamation. He was also as vocal as he could be about the way in which he left Forest and saying that it was not a happy departure. Yeah, he he was quite unhappy with how it how it all came about because I think it was Sabri who Sabri Lamucci had taken over by that point, and he was still around for a few months into that season, and then eventually ended up leaving. And I think went back to Sweden, um, but he did feel like somebody who got away and probably was just a victim of the the great upheaval at Forest around that time. And just for completeness, I'll I'll go through the other clues mm. because. When he joined Forest, he signed an 18th month contract, but he only stayed with the club for eight of those months. So that would have been my next clue. The one after that, he wore shirt number 17 on Trent's side. And the final one, I think that had you not got it by this point, I was hoping you would have done with this final clue. He scored his one and only goal for Forest in a 3 0 win over Middlesbrough in April 2019. That was the, the game that Forest were. Probably at their 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 best under Martin O'Neill. It was the was game that the Gerard Carvalho Car- game. Carvalho, yeah, the Carvalho and wasn't match. It, wasn't it an absolute belter by Milosevic? Yeah, I seem to remember it was. Yeah. Was it from from a really acute angle or something, and he just wellied it? Yeah, like was it a set piece that dropped or something? He wellied something it in. like that. Yeah. yeah. So that was yeah. that was Alex Milosevic. I always rated him, and I was yeah. disappointed he left. I always, I always felt that he had quite a lot to offer and I think he went back to Sweden AIK correct me if I'm wrong and he got back into the Sweden team as well after leaving Forest so you know shows his pedigree another great bit of business there from uh, from Forest transfer uh, transfer policies in the early days um, and you mentioned hope... and you mentioned uh, Michael Heffler there he got more points on his license than Derby did uh, in that Premier League season in 0708 <laughs> I thought you were going to make 20... a comment I think, you're make, of them. I think you're going to make a comment about um, uh, the famous Derby uh, drink driving incident, but there you go. Um, <laughs> anyway, well, that's, that's something whereby we don't have the legal resources to be able to comment any further. Um, so, um, Tom, as our quiz winner, you get to choose our closing music. So what are you going to go for? Um, I will go True Faith by New Order, please. OK. Any particular reason for that? No, just one of my favourite songs. Okie doke, and we have true faith that Forrest will do better this season. This is why I get paid the big bucks. Um, so before we leave you, we want to say thank you to Tom and Stephen, as well as to Jeremy, Adam and Zach and Ellie. Uh, thank you um, to Sports Social for their continued support for our podcast. We'll be back in midweek with a retro podcast as our pundits choose their best forest teams from their lifetimes and we'll also have a friday five news roundup at the end of the week and of course then it is the big kickoff and we'll have a match report after the bournemouth game uh, next weekend so until then thank you very much listener for joining us as i say do uh, leave us a review get in touch with our social media and thank you for being part of this experience and come on you reds
Social Podcast Network.